Hi everyone, and thank you for tuning in to this event, which features readings by three poets recently published through the Rabbit Poet series, including Alice Allen, Antonia Pont, and Natalie Briggs. My name is Jess Wilkinson, and I'm the editor in chief of Rabbit Journal and the Rabbit Poet series. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge the people of the Kulin Nations on whose unceded lands we are communicating on today. I'm currently on Wathorong and Wadawarung land. I respectfully acknowledge their elders past and present. So Rabbit, a journal for nonfiction poetry, was founded in mid-2011 and our 30th issue, which runs to more than 250 pages, has just been released. The journal celebrates the potential for poetry to explore and interrogate the boundaries of nonfiction writing. It encourages poets to openly engage with autobiography and biography, history, politics, economics, mathematics, cultural analysis, science, the environment, and all other aspects of real world experience recollection and interpretation. I've got a, a couple of, um, or <laughs> a pile of um, examples uh, to show our viewers today. That's the belonging issue with poetry guest edited by Eileen Chong. Um, the indigenous issue, which was guest edited by Alison Whitaker. Um, sport, guest edited by Liam Fernie. Um, the dance issue, um, myself and Jennifer McKenzie selected the poetry for that. Um, the BSP interns at RMIT University guest edited the poetry for the youth issue. Um, David Stavanger and Pascal Burton did tense. And there's a whole bunch of other, yeah, other issues here as well, including politics, geography, lineages, the LGBT issue and more. So... Um, all of those issues, back issues, can be purchased online, but also you can just see the range that um, the journal addresses. So the Rabbit Poet Series publishes poetry collections by single authors with a sort of non-fiction bent. And uh, so far the journal, uh, sorry, the Rabbit Poet Series just publishes emerging Australian poets. So today we celebrate three of those books. Um, just quickly, for those wanting to subscribe to Rabbit, you can do so through the website rabbitpoetry.com and subscribers to the journal receive any books in the Rabbit Poet series published during that year for free. Uh, you can also purchase any of those titles or journal issues separately. So before I introduce the first of our poets, I'd like to extend a few thanks um, to the Australia Council for the Arts and to Creative Victoria, who provided some much needed funding across the past two years. And to RMIT and in particular, the Nonfiction Lab for their support of the journal also. To Tracy O'Shaughnessy, Zoe Zunko and the Bowen Street Press interns at RMIT University, who came on board to assist with Rabbit. And to our typesetter and designer, Chris Black. Finally, to Anita Solak, Kat Betts, Luke Nicol, Lauren Webster, and Abby Tapp for their editing and proofreading skills on these three Rabbit Poet series titles. And thank you also to Ruby and the Emerging Writers Festival for this spot tonight. So that's enough from me. Without further ado, I will introduce our first reader and RPS poet, Alice Allen. And this is the beautiful cover of Alice's book. So Alice Allen is a writer and editor living in Melbourne. She publishes the podcast Poetry Says, which is an excellent podcast, check it out, uh, where she interviews poets from Australia and overseas. Um, her first book, The Empty Show, was commended in the 2019 Anne Elder Award. So Alice is going to read some poems for us now, and then I will ask her a few questions about her poetry. Thanks, Alice. Thanks so much, Jess. I'm so excited to be here. I am speaking to you all from the 
unceded lands of the uh, Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation and love to pay my respects to their elders past and present. Really, really excited, a little nervous to be part of this um, Emerging Writers Festival slot. Um, it's weird. I haven't read for such a long time and all of a sudden it feels very nerve wracking, even though I'm just talking to my laptop right here. Um, but I'm going to read you four poems out of the empty show. And this is the first poem in the book. It's called Melbourne Sonnet. A sonnet is always a love poem. So I was taught. Fourteen lines betray you to your reader. But your subject can be anything. In fact, it's possible to avoid the word you completely. And anyway, a sonnet won't get you laid. All poems ignore the longing in them. On my way here, I stared too long in the wrong direction. A woman my age totted across Collins Street to say, and this bitch is looking at me like, no, no, I wasn't looking at you. I was looking at the laneway behind you. She put her arm around my waist and kissed me on my cheek while staring at the man I still call my boyfriend. I held her as she swayed. Lonely is the worst way to be drunk on Collins Street. A sonnet is always a love poem. I, too, drink too much. Then I catch the 86 home, trying to keep my feet from interfering with the feet of the other passengers. Uh, this next poem is a very short poem that I worked on for a very long time. It's called Dog Park. My dog moves closer, further up by inches. The car door is a promise. The dog park, a dictionary. Sticks offer themselves up. Sun does its usual. Waiting makes sea glass. The park squeals, dogless. My dog refuses the leash, knowing lies are prayer beads, knowing company is a belt, raising a vein. So now that I've read those two short ones, I'm going to follow up with a couple of longer, more narrative poems. And this first one is for anyone who hates flying as much as I do. It's called Eight Minutes and 33 Seconds at a Time. To the woman seat 22A on flight to Sydney to Melbourne, who to Don McLean's American Pie approximately 11 times in a row. I know it must have been 11 times because that's how many times an eight minute, 33 second song goes into a 95 minute flight. I saw you reach up to stab at the touch screen until the progress bar zeroed again. I thought, maybe this is your version of safety, but it's not as if you were swatting tears or gripping the armrest. You were reading a market insights report while beyond your blonde head, I could see Don's smiling face. It's the seventies. Nothing can go wrong. Maybe my miniaturized bottle of red is speaking now that we're 34,000 feet above somewhere west of Canberra, but 22A, I think I might stop, back, play. I admit I took my eyes off you. I got distracted crying at the scene in that new show Crashing when Pete Holmes is crying at Emma Thompson, crying when she says to Alan Rickman in Love Actually, imagine your husband bought a gold necklace and come Christmas, gave it to somebody else. Then I saw you through the gap reaching up, stop, back, play. In 22C, a woman with two iPhones stabbed at her game involving lining up crystals and sausages. I fear flying. I fear turbulence, faulty landing gear, hijacking, mid-air explosions. I fear it all enough to compensate for everyone else on the plane who doesn't fear these things. Stop. Back. Our screens flash. Cabin announcement in progress. Those sweet words. Ladies and gentlemen, the captain at the top of our descent. Our bodies in a slow fall toward my adopted city where everything's a friendly grid. 22A, I fall in love so easily. We survived. You and your suitcase went straight for the taxi rank. 
And the last poem I want to share with you is uh, a poem I wrote in response to uh, uh, Kenneth Koch's poem, The Circus, and it's called Geraniums. I want to tell you a story. It's about a woman beside a church I overheard talking while I was walking down Lafayette Avenue. I want it to have been Lafayette Avenue because, let's face it, what a great name. But the truth is, I'm not sure if it was there or some other street in Brooklyn. I just bought something to eat, maybe a donut. I was alone, wandering vaguely towards the subway, and I passed a church. It might have been a manual Baptist church, but again, I can't be sure about that or about whether the woman was watering geraniums or some other flower. The sky was white, sending out dots of water, and a man walking towards her said something about, didn't she know there was rain coming? She looked up and replied in a sort of exhausted way, I've been waiting all day for the rain, Jack. Being away from the places you usually live in can make minor things seem more significant. It's like all the buildings and streets and cars are full of things they want to say to you, which of course they are. And your notebook fills up with scraps about design thinking or quotes from Say Yes to the Dress Malaysia. Coke says, it is understandable enough to be nervous with anybody. I'm nervous to tell you about this woman, about what she said, because there's nothing significant about it at all, even though I still remember it, even though I still want to tell you. Wanting to tell you doesn't mean it's worth telling. Last week, there was another woman I just met. Sometimes when I meet new people, I will force intimacy by saying too much. And because the topic came up anyway, I told her that I finally managed to get my maternal ambivalence into a neat little box. I want that box, Alice, she said. Even though we'd just met, it seemed unfair to let her think I had any real resolution on the topic. I quickly added, don't worry, it'll blow away in the next wind. Then we mutually retreated from the conversation. The woman beside the church not waiting for rain was over two years ago and honestly, there have been plenty of times I've been so angry at the inadequacy of my description that I've given up on this poem completely. A friend of mine said her poetry teacher had told her never to use second person in a poem. Probably this teacher was sick of reading poems talking to you. I tried taking out all the second person, then I stripped out all the first person and the whole thing disintegrated. I read the first draft out to Tom in the car while we were driving back to New York from Massachusetts. Pretty much immediately I knew it needed a complete rewrite. The circus is addressed to Coke's first wife, Janice Elwood. I thought it was about a lost poem, but reading it again now, I realise it's a convoluted apology for spending too much time working and not enough time tending to his relationship. Thanks for listening, everyone. Thanks, Jess. I realised <laughs> I, I rushed into my poems too quickly to to say the thank you I wanted to say to you for including me in the series. I'm so honoured to be one of the Rabbit Poets. Oh, that's very sweet. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a great collection. So for our listeners and our watchers tonight, uh, you can log on to the website, rabbitpoetry.com, and pick up a, a copy of Alice's fantastic book. So let's talk poetry, Alice. Um, and interesting to flip the mic <laughs> on you yeah, and the role. Nerve wracking. What is it? Do I do this to people every time? Jeez, I'm sorry. <laughs> yep, yep. Um, and uh, yeah, so Poetry Says is such a great podcast, and everyone yeah. should check it out um, for those great conversations with poets. The um, the flying poem. And the fear of flying, I remember connecting with that when I first read your manuscript because I have a terrible fear of flying and I've had um, conversations with other poets about this as well. Uh, so, yeah, that really that really um, speaks to me quite a lot. Um, so, questions. First of all, how do you feel about the term nonfiction poetry and what do you think uh, it does, if anything, um, when you write about these real occurrences like being on the on the plane and filtering that kind of information through a poem what do you think happens in that process for you yeah it's maybe it's a more of a case of what doesn't happen <laughs> but 
Yeah, I've had a, a sort of a changing relationship with that term since I first heard about rabbit back when I lived in Canberra. And I remember thinking, what, what, what does she mean? Aren't all poems nonfiction? But then <laughs> as I started writing more, I realised there was there was a shaping that was going on. There was like a an internal critic and editor that was taking fact out and um, maybe smoothing edges here and there. And um, I used to do a lot of that. And then I got really sick of it and sick of my my tendency to do that and just really wanted to tell as close to the truth as possible. So when I'm writing a poem through that lens, which I feel like I always am, I feel like it's a process of inclusion, trying to keep the truth in even when I don't look particularly um, self-focused uh, or, or pretty in that moment. Um, and I think, yeah, uh, eight minutes, 33 seconds at a time is <laughs> is that because there's so much mundanity on a flight, mm -hmm. you know, people playing with two iPhones and then also geraniums, I think the nonfiction element there is I'm admitting to you constantly that I don't actually know, I don't remember what actually happened. So, yeah, it's it's a really interesting term to keep in mind when you're writing a poem. Great. And throughout The Empty Show, there's also these um, photographs of lost yeah. signs, like lost dog, lost wombat toy, lost handbag. Yeah. What, what's going on there? What are you wanting to do? And how do you want the, there to be um, uh, a kind of, I guess, tension between these images and the poems themselves? Um, well, maybe it comes back to the nonfiction question as well. I came across these lost notices all together over a couple of weeks in, I think, 2015, in underpass, um, writing to work, and I just had to take photos of them. It was like an evolving art exhibition. People were putting these notices up, and I couldn't figure out whether they were made up or not, but I just had to photograph them, and I'm so proud and happy that they've made it into the book because they're not mine. They're, they're ready-mades, if anything, um, but I wanted those artists to have a life beyond the underpass because one day I came in and it was all painted over um, with a huge tag. It was all gone at once. But, yeah, the tension between them and the poems, um, I I guess I would love, like, ideally my poems to have a photographic quality um, and for there to be a sense of, like, this is a, a snapshot and we're only seeing things from one angle. Um yeah, but I haven't, I haven't really thought about that deeply, but I think... I mean, I, I think there's a humour in the poems that is also reflected in the fact that you, you included these notices because they're very funny. They're so funny. Um, yeah. yeah. I, mean, I was saying as a compliment to myself, like these people were re very funny <laughs> what they were doing. <laughs> like Lost Rabbits, um, seen here, Too Fast to Catch. Too Fast to Catch. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, very cute. Um, and the bag one also I remember being. Yeah, yeah, bag. It looks like this. And then there's a drawing with the word tools spelled with a Z. Mm. Um, and one that just says lost something. <laughs> lost something? So yeah. they, they started to respond to one another and they built up over the weeks that I passed this place. And, um, yeah, I just love them. They're my favourite thing in the book. <laughs> mm. Yeah. Oh, no, the poems are great. <laughs> I mean, it's interesting what you say about the snapshot, um, because I feel like they're not um, they're not photographic in a visual sense. Mm. Um, they're they're snapshots also in well in some of the poems, like the one after the one about um, the jazz one. Yeah. Um, you must believe in spring. Yeah. After the elevens. Mm. Uh, there's a sort of sonic quality, I guess, that you're capturing there. So it's like a, a sound bite. There's like, yeah, different kind of bites and some of them are snapshots of different um, of different sort of sense, sense qualities, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And maybe there's also a quality of memory and how these things fall apart when when you try to 
to capture them because even though these photos represent you know parts of that wall they can't represent the whole thing together or the way those things interrelated so yeah it's a good question I have to think on that <laughs> and um finally what what's your favorite poem from the empty show and oh, why wow what a question <laughs> what a question it's Who like who's your poem? favorite poet right yeah like, I mean, or what's your favorite poem I hate that question <laughs> well look I am really happy and ex so so I wrote a poem called Venice which is made up of a lot of found text um, from messages exchanged between my partner and I and you encouraged me you when we met up to talk about my manuscript you said this is an epic but it only at this stage goes for one page you encouraged me to get really expansive with it and um I love it because it represents, again, that mundanity, but also, you know, a deep love between my partner and I. And um, and humour. And humorous. And yes, I, I think there are moments, a lot of, yeah, the things that he sends me are quite funny and, and silly and strange. So I love that that's on the page and it mm -hmm. gives me a real thrill to think that other people might read that poem and, and get something out of it too. Mm -hmm. It's so playful. To me, it's like uh, the perfect sort of poetic response or poem text response to the lost images. <laughs> in yeah, the yeah, yeah, true. Mm. Great. Well, thank you so much, Alice. And uh, a round of applause for Alice Allen. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, and uh, thanks for participating in tonight. And um, yeah. See you next time. Our second reader is Antonia Pont. And just to read a uh, bio for Antonia. Antonia is a poet, essayist, practitioner, and theorist. She teaches and supervises in writing and literature at Deakin University. In 2009, she founded Vidyana, I hope I've said that right, uh, Yoga Australia where she continues to teach and practice. She lives with gratitude on Wurundjeri land. And you will not know in advance what you'll feel. Has been shortlisted recently for the 2020 Mary Gilmore Award. Antonia, it's great to have you here. Thank you very much, Jess. It's nice to talk. It's nice to talk to, to live faces at the moment. Maybe I'll start with a poem from the first section of the book, which opens the book, and it's called Of Seldom Kind. It begins, how will we look back? Against themselves, our spindles draw back and back, primed as if for wakeless flight, arched red against risks of a certain unity's slackness. Here today, rare sky of faded navy hatched by blonde boughs, all of us among the signs of an unknown season, expertly watching increments of humidity, pressure, then sun and moon's degree, we consult minutiae in a new work of precision for motion, deciding. The alive time, fear frills us everywhere in white trails of rendering particulars, yet we're here, brinked to fall or even discover gravity's flip side that the world is less those ways of up or down. Still, minor adjustments to height extend of use reach unimaginably. Days consist of listening, turning, speaking, of our wild arms around each other, of our close far voices around the other, then images of water. We have committed to kindness, to its sparse austerities and mammoth swoons. All of us, nowhere similar, facing our faces, chests, palms, throats, into a seething future. Its potential steadiness flashing, falling dark. I see no recognisable shapes here. In speaking's channel I speak, try to fill silence with patience with that which can be offered. For you, for you, for me, for this life now landed in our lap like a kitten. All of us. All of our relations to time, those usual hells, changed, come new. Overexposure of guarantee reveals sensed terrors of a seldom kind. And in the films, the water moves.
So I'll, I'll read something from the next section. So there's uh, five sections in the book and a coda. And the next section um, has a, a poem that's really personal to me and maybe we'll, Jess and I will discuss this a little bit as in the, the, the non-fictional nature of, of the work that Rabbit makes. Um, so this poem is called Some Home. Do you recall the low stone wall, smell of lawn spun wet to the quick and swallows scooping green evening's gauze, sky stretched to tearing, all that wasn't said. New vanilla heads, smeary tables, soaping skin, dolphins slick in the deep old bath. And kerosene's cupola, staring brighter, hotter, as if sun catching an architect's copper in that moist walled kitchen, slabs of butter cake and trees beyond the triple walls groaning in the press of future, all that was, and was still to come. You raked gravel and I arranged obsessively the oak table, portly chairs, sideboard with prattling crockery, inching their weight with fierce legs, intent and alone, everything into new reparative places. Those dinner parties off to the side beside floor to ceiling windows that pressed clear like fresh blisters into all you hadn't seen coming decanting what was sayable into question mark spines of slopped tongue rural guests, consume one bowl and muslin in my dreams of a possible home escaping from windows, its thin ha hair in the wisteria and sex on a darkened screen, people being very nearly eaten. My child's feet on the polished, can't remember its name, for the fire that stops burning, burning further, socks glowing, socked to the heart with heat. Never admit desire or death among the thick sentence of a honeycombed family. Eat chocolate in company, lick your tiny fingers, loathe Sunday night movies of golden dogs gone missing, plead for test cricket. Long dresses pretending to rhyme with summer, meadows, copses, pretending an adhesive quality to stop the carcasses coming out of drought's recent solution. I held my ribs tight to stop any leaking, taught myself to roller skate on buckling, mauve strewn concrete. Once I jumped from the oak down through its boughs onto a dried out perished net of trampoline that didn't hold and stood stunned on roots and grass. Around me reeled far cows, calculus of swallows, our kelpie in flight. All about like a merry-go-round the remorseless sky stuck in place. The manager's boy, he'd watch me swim naked. Mermaids, we called it, my gill legs together writing words on slate tiles, reading evaporations. That sky, an unreadable ache, stuck, always stuck above that mute space station, adrift in squatocracy, its asteroid belt of Janies, Jillies, Sallies, Sues and Prues, we were so far from gravity. Denim thighs patched with prints of Laura Ashley and that slight kind one, a friend's mother, whose late stroke belied her perfect Anzacs so faultlessly round we devoured their symmetry the way blood's derivations devoured hers mushrooms poking stiff white brains like lewd demands into frosty mornings all that we ate all that i studied to forget a smooth feeling afterwards blank as labor the dead baby had been long before his fine clean fabric held us though and we worked and failed in spectacular verbosity to understand the sanctity of work at all. We moved only, but never seemed moved. Munching bales and bales of straw dry, stupid words. The next one, I think I'll read. Maybe I'll read cleavage because it's a bit funny and a bit rude, um, which is about boobs really. Why not? I think it's, it's a little shorter. Cleavage. Why is the fat that feeds us when amassed in fabric and forced high perk and dry in a thing called cleavage going to draw my eye? I who know nothing of these anatomical wilds, these topoi of sleep and gag and reeling. To fold a body over onto itself, to bind it like a book stitched at its spine. If I slide unwittingly from describing words to nouns, if I call it something without finding a rhyme for mammary, mammary rack of lamb, for lubricated slip and slide. A crease at the hip is also fine beneath buttocks and in the gather where a nice girl wedges a clutch purse, 
men and lesbians and everyone else may gaze, curdle and expire. Regretting pump expressed bottle fed one night formula times. I wonder how it's done, this polyester squishigami. It bespeaks tremendous structural whiz with its heaving bespoke breathlessness. Ah, this is the other one I wanted to read. So this was one actually um, commissioned in a way for uh, the feminist anthology that um, Jessica Wilkinson and Bonnie Cassidy put out some years ago. So it's a political feminist poem. So I'll read that. Technique. Try to remember without flinching. It will smart like saline, but will train you. It will sting like broken skin on the back of a wrist. And although bracing is not fatal, it will make your mind fast and crisp. Ferociousness will surge through you. Perhaps you'll tilt your face to the ceiling of your room, your home, your place of employment, to the sky's big plainness. And with closed eyes and shaking your head, you'll smile as if drinking in a delayed rain, a bit breathless with the vertigo of where you've been. You will no longer feel crazy. You will no longer do surgery on what you know to make it include what they can bear to know of themselves, of their piles of fudged histories and convenient arrangements. They may be broken in all sorts of places, maybe. Entitlement is broken clarity, a seeing that never works as seeing, but works in other ways at others' expense, except when you don't comply and need nothing in exchange, need no trades anymore, not even for them to concur or approve or sign your papers of leave or temporary visas of decency. You have decided to see, and you will repeat and repeat this decision that you will take up repeatedly with renewed technique and tenacity and being your decision, it demands nothing from you. You do not have to change your ways, your timetable, your domestic arrangements, your diet, your profession, your name, your preference, your style, your sex. You can proceed and carry on as before. You do not have to react in any way or muster explanation. In the glare of your commitment, it may be that they'll swell from looking's heat or explode like aliens trapped in a beam, but that's not your concern. You are neither the root nor trigger of their difficulties. What counts is that you'll no longer be driving yourself off sanity's cliff. Anxiety will leave you like a troop of fleas and you will find with your definitive gaze by merely looking, not veering, not embellishing, not shirking, that that old order will, like some old and obsolete lining, come away. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure there are plenty of other people clapping. <laughs> I, re I represent the hordes. <laughs> Thanks, Antonia. Um, great. I mean, there's so much in this book and there's so many different themes and um, it's uh, the just to, to ask you a few of many, many possible questions that I can. Um, you draw a lot on art. So there's sort of film and, um, you know, art references. So there's one poem that's after. <laughs> as Sorry. K-pop is the other form of art. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, so, yeah, film and, um, and, and artwork uh, like Agnes Martin is – one of the poems that you just read there. Uh, there's another one that's written um, after Louise Bourgeois. What does what do these other art forms do for your poetry? And then what do you do with with them or with what they spark um, mm. for your poetry? How how does that how does that end up as a poem for you? Oh, that's such a fun question. Thanks for asking it. Um, strangely, I've always been very um, I don't know poetically stimulated when I when I see and encounter artworks and often um, not textual artworks. So I think um, because I've been writing poetry for a very long time, like I would write poems after seeing dance pieces. I would write poems after seeing comedy monologues. I'd write a poem. So you know, kind of a in a way, I've, I think I've got a really long-standing ekphrastic practice in a sense that it's it's so nice because um I guess interestingly, you know, maybe we'll go on and talk about this, but you know the the, there can be a kind of um, sluggishness that can come in non-fiction work where the I becomes so loud in a way. Um, and I don't, 
I don't disparage that actually. Sometimes we love to read about the loud I and I, and I want to write about myself or my experiences or whatever. Um, but it's nice sometimes to place that in, in a kind of um, vibrational series or something. And it's like the artworks, they're recasting the self, you know, like that I'm different in front of the artwork. I'm sort of refreshed and, and, and just reborn as something else through that effective um, resonance. And so I think I've always found that it, it, it gives the work this extra force and life that that actually isn't in me. It's in that you know, as as various philosophers would say, it's sort of in the artwork. It's the artworks or sort of autonomous force that it has. So I don't know if that answers the question, but yeah, that yeah, the po I think you know I I'll either write directly afterwards or I've often trailed around galleries, you know, alone on you know those strange lonely trips one makes uh, in Australia or elsewhere, you know, in galleries and just kind of penciling yeah that kind of like whatever words come you know not not particularly um yeah, definitely not deliberate in any sense i mean deliberately doing being there for the encounter but not um deliberately fashioning the the words in a way like quite um you know it, it's pulled it's pulled from me almost by the artwork i think yeah yeah great response i love that uh, uh, i love I the love phrase the, the loud oh. eye oh i can hear <laughs> myself doubled there <laughs> heard an echo um uh, yeah the loud eye and the soft eye and um also this idea of a a new kind of ekphrasis that like it, it that the the artwork is almost not um is not immediately um recognizable in the palms no. um but is more uh um yeah, a resonance or something in a different way, that that effective response. So, yeah, I think that's really interesting in your poems. Um, another thing that, uh, another strong thing that comes to me when I read your poems is uh, the depictions of the body. Um, and so you read one of the, the cleavage poem and uh, also... <laughs> It was actually my friend doing a performance art piece as um as a kind of yeah as a feminist kind of icon in crazy lame polyester. So in a way, that's another ekphrastic poem completely. Yeah. This amazing performance, and she's got this awesome bosom, and so it was pushed up in this polyester crazy dress, and so it just did seem like a I was trying to talk about a kind of sculptural work, mm -hmm. um, just made of flesh. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Um, and you've got the poem Raw Body as well uh, in the collection, and um, anyway, just the um, sometimes revealing, sometimes um, like leaky or abject, sometimes just flung open. I think we had a conversation about this when uh, we went through, you know, editing the book uh, about the the like the wide open body or 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 seeing it from different angles. Yeah, how do you how do you feel about that aspect in your your work how would you describe your coming at um the body or depictions of the body or representations of the body yeah it's so interesting when you say that um because of course the body's represented in in the poem in a way but I think because of my yoga practice and just long-term body body person practice you know as, as men, I'm sure many listeners have have this going on it's not unusual but um I think I don't actually think of the body as a seen object that much. So it's interesting that it may still arrive to the reader um, as representations of the body, but it's I don't really write so often from... It's not that the gaze isn't there within, like, desire and sex and whatever. I mean, and of course, the, the cleavage poem is absolutely about the person setting themselves up as a, as a, view, as a viewed object in an art uh, uh, it was in an art gallery, technique. it was at the Margaret Lawrence Gallery where that was. Um, yeah, but I think for me, I sort of inhabit very much inside the body and I guard against the world, culture, media, selfie culture, letting me turn my body too much into a seen thing. Mm. I don't want it to only be a seen thing because it feels like a site of real oppression, I'd say, for all genders at the moment. I mean, traditionally it's been kind of a site of oppression for 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 women or women identifying bodies but I think it's actually across the board and there's something I think 
it's not that there isn't the gaze. The gaze is active in desire and we do see ourselves and we're also curious about, you know, children are curious to see their faces and arms and hands in mirrors. Um, we, we take photos, we wonder what the world sees of us. Um, but I think when that's, the, to get that word, word again, the loudest um, mm. part of our experience of our bodies, it, it just goes a little wrong. And so I think, um, I don't know whether you would also have a different experience after discussing with me and reading back over the poems to, and I'll read back looking at like whether they, where it is, whether it's more scopic or whether it's sort of um, a kind of a, a viewpoint from within the flesh rather than onto the flesh. Um, I'd say that that's where I write from is much more what it feels like and kind of forces moving through bodies as they encounter each other, but not not so much as not not cinematic things that we watch. I think I think it's the watching of the body that's making us all have much worse sex. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes better, but mostly not not a little cram cramps your style a little. <laughs> I mean, definitely the way that you use language pull, pulls you away from something um, like more of a um, habitual way of understanding the, and viewing the body. Um, so just a final quick question, yeah, is about the nonfiction remit of rabbit. Yeah, what do you think of that term, nonfiction poetry? What can nonfiction poetry do for you, or how do you think about your poems as nonfiction? I think I'd have to think hard to find poems that were fictional. Yeah, in an in an interesting way. I mean, in yeah, they're, they're strange genre divisions in a sense that that that, that shape our practice probably that helped shape our practice that that's that's where one way where they're productive um I felt very comfortable like presenting the manuscript to rabbit because um yeah I think I think I've you know definitely grown up like most of us have reading you know lyric poetry and confessional poetry and you know kind of the, that you know stuff through the 20th century as well as more conceptual experimental stuff and probably there's a a meeting there for me it's like I, I think um I mean, nonfiction to me sort of suggests that looking at the world as it presents itself to us will be a lot and it will be very creative and mm. it will be very alive and surprising and that real life, if that's a place where we draw nonfiction from, is extraordinarily odd mm. <laughs> and, and odd enough odd enough to, to, to work for poetry or something like mm. that. Um, and maybe for me sometimes, I guess I'm I'm not really, I, I notice this, I'm not really a narrative maker-upper. Just like, yeah. just in my, you know, I don't kind of do flights of fancy. It just could be mm -hmm. my, like, pragmatic mm. style. It's like I'm kind of interested in what's happening in the world. And I also don't want to live through my fantasy. I want to live, I want to live out what I want to do, not imagine it in a weird way. And so mm -hmm. there's something like, I, I don't know, I, I don't know. I think I think nonfiction is sort of what 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 did what did you end up living? Like what decisions did you make? Where what, where did the crossroads go? What 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 happened and what did you decide? Like that those things can create quite extraordinary arcs if you like. Mm -hmm. um, but they're they're not sort of invented. I guess they're they're experienced and 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 also poetry helps me to understand the arcs I've lived through in all their sort of odd extraordinariness extraordinariness um and and sort of um mediocrity i mean often we we live the same stories as everyone else as well as living unique ones at the same time i don't know if that answers it <laughs> yeah 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 i mean poetry helps me think too it's it's interesting if you if you google non-fiction definition it says prose writing da 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 da, da. and i guess i i'm just Ah, uh, yes, yeah, why why not poetry? Uh, and and because poetry can access all the different things that um, that prose can't, you know, just with its range of affordances. That, that's no, that's perfect. I think. Well, the, the problem with, I mean, the problem, the what, the reason poetry would be so perfect for the non-fictional is because what we live is much more like a stanza with an enjambment with a broken off, fallen off sentence end, with strange punctuations, with uh, gaps and blanks. Like that's that's what yeah, being that's alive blank. feels like. And <laughs> I mean, none of the novels I read feel like being alive. I mean, as in they only retroactively do after you've read the novel, but it's mm -hmm. like our lives are never as tidy as narrative would like. 
so in that sense, you know, I think your your gesture of, of, of making a space for nonfiction poetry is extremely astute. And and poetry is a living live thing as well as perfect <laughs> for your poetry as well. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So thank you, Antonia, for this chat and for reading your poems. And being a splendid to, editor and colleague. So. <laughs> and to, to all our listeners, um, jump on the website and pick up a copy of Antonia's book. Um, so thank you. And thanks to the Emerging Writers Festival for, for offering um, this space to, to me and to many others. It's wonderful. Thanks. So our third reader is Natalie Briggs. And Nat is the author of self-published chapbooks, The Burial is Polite from 2014, and I Was Kneeling in Her from 2017. Natalie's poems have appeared occasionally on the web and in print in places such as Verge, Law Journal and Pank. Natalie is a white so-called Australian American, as her bio says, and her book Who Loves It All is being printed as we speak. So very excited to have Natalie as part of the Rabbit Poet series. Natalie is now going to read some poems and then I'll ask her some questions about her poetry. Thank you, Jess, and everyone at Rabbit and everyone at Emerging Writers Fest for having me. I'm just going to jump right into the poems. 12th of March until the 5th of August. My father took such hot baths, he nearly passed out towel around his waist, head bent. I'm invited to a writing group, but I don't want to be around sad queers this winter. I want the ease of the ease of straight people. The day I moved in with my ex, the moving van man was flirting with her. He kept saying to me, or oh, put this in your bedroom, even though there was only one room with a bed. Today is my father's birthday. On my mother's birthday, I took Valium and Shat in my favourite jeans. I left them in my courtyard for months. I cleaned them last week and I'm wearing them today. When I visited my friend in LA, I wanted to stay in her apartment forever with her rabbit, whom she said had a hard time making friends. I wanted to cook my friend dinner and do her dishes while she went to work. The arrangement would have been romantic. Maybe we would never kiss, but would support one another perfectly. She slept on the carpet with her rabbit because she didn't like her bed. I was jet lagged, but not at all sad. I didn't get jealous. I just remembered that the camera is not my face, but in fact up here. <clears throat> I didn't get jealous until I was in a much quieter city fucking myself in the shower after listening to a man talk about how smart octopus are during a three hour drive through the desert. Listing the four people I've fallen in love with this week is happening less since I've been loving this one person. We all laugh during the lesbian sex scene. I laugh the loudest. It's impractical for me to stay with the pain. Someone told me it's the only way we know we're alive. Tell that to someone who can't forget they have a body, not even for a second. What is useful is all I obsess over. How to use what I have for others. I achieve the sentiment rarely. It's not satisfying to stay in pain. There's too much to do. The most erotic image I saw today, three thin palm trees tied together with a rope, a basketball in the middle of the trunks, keeping them tensely together apart. You tell me I walk around all day upright, but when I'm in your arms, everything bends. It would be useful if power wasn't understood as money. I want to feel safe. I want other things too. Sex, views, nice suits. I can't become a man yet. I'm not sure I'm not seduced by the power I'd have. It's hard to realize and it's not the whole truth. 
family poem. So I keep laying forward. I returned home recently to recover my childhood. I failed, of course, but found I'm now just my age, not anyone's parent, not anyone's child. I found women able to withstand extraordinary pain and wake up still able to bond and give love to others. Eternal love. She sent him the picture of herself naked reading his book at 8.30 a.m. Tells me she could have retired then and there from sexting. I sent my lover a 12 second video of myself sucking off an eggplant. Lobe, elbow, knee, thumb, hip bone, nose. They replied, nice produce. I would think they were being funny, but they aren't very funny. It wasn't my naked reading your book moment. I respect they may not have been in the mood, but it's always more than that. I wanted their laughter, a video of them going down on a persimmon, dragon fruit for dramatic flair. I knew then I couldn't move to New York. They aren't my papaya sucking eternal love. She's just got a couple more. I think I'm doing okay for time. Tits. I'm sick of people who've had top surgery saying, I'm so glad I can take my shirt off in public now. I get it, but I hope I can keep my tits, take my shirt off and still be trans in public or not trans at all on the days I'm not trans at all. My point is tits. Saw my body do things to waves and waves do things to my body. She makes me wrap something over her eyes, eyes while she fucks me with a strap on. It's purple and she hates purple as good a reason as any. Just going to read two more because I'm not sure how much time I have. You've got plenty of time, Nat. Do I? So I'm okay. All right, cool. <laughs> All right, I just, I forgot that I didn't look at the time. So, okay, I'll just read the poems I have left them. Body from inside. My sister, six, six weeks pregnant with her second child, asks me, do you think it's a boy? I love this question despite myself. Yes. Brother, her two-year-old yells, brother, Buddha, Bada. Our missing third sibling, we feel him circling, head resting on our shoulders. Brother, butter, bruder. My sister miscarries at nine weeks, tells me over the phone while on a long aerobic walk to the lighthouse in our hometown. She was sad for the first 24 hours. Now she's okay. My mother calls. Don't tell your sister I think the baby's still alive. I don't tell my sister. I don't know what to say to either of them. Only thinking of the people I've told whom I'll have to untell. My sister reports one in four. It's common to lose a body from inside. Hair poem. I didn't shave my head to rebel against the patriarchy. It was to rebel against a lover who told me I looked like that character from the movie The Dreamers, played by Michael Pitt. Another ex sent me Catherine Lord's The Summer of Her Boldness, I believe, to make fun of me. I hate hair touching my face. I don't have time for that. I sat on my new lover's toilet seat the other day and felt the thinnest layer of dust on my ass. I told her and she replied, you're sensitive, aren't you? I don't think it was a compliment. 3 a.m. My body 9 a.m. or closer to early afternoon swiped across continents. I dreamt in sci-fi. Creatures from somewhere else telling me I'm too attached to the idea of family to understand how the universe really works. I got into trouble for bouncing on the creature's trampoline. The trampoline would light up if the bouncer was crazy. It did not light up when I bounced. Jet lag is a lovely phrase. I've eaten a mandarin and half an unripe banana. Drinking coffee. I call my old new lover, no answer. Another mirror. 
It's late for me, but not for her. I've had two wines, want chips. The bright lights in the fast food restaurant are romantic in the sense that she can tell me I need to stop dating younger people. I need to wait for my mirror. She's married now, lives elsewhere, owns a house with her mirror man. She and I dated years ago and not for long. She says goodbye, tells me I need to let her be the mother of our friendship. I say, okay. This is the last poem. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. The last disagreement we had, whether people on a plant-based diet get enough protein. They told me they knew because they were vegan in their early 20s. There was a plate of chicken in front of them, hungry from the testosterone, not wanting salad. I told them I felt better eating less animal and they said eating less in the summer feels good for everyone. I asked them to wrestle and they looked at me like no one had ever asked them to wrestle. Head into my chest, small ram pushing. I ended up on my hands and knees, unmovable, holding them on my back, wanting to test my strength against someone who'd been rubbing the testosterone into their belly and arms every morning for months. The last round, the longest. They pushed me off the mattress onto the floor, got up and left the room. I'm so competitive, they said, not looking back. Thank you. I know it's so weird sort of talking into the ether <laughs> and um, without the usual pause yeah. between palms for the audience to respond. Um, yeah. I know it's a strange environment, but um, thank you, Nat. Uh, that was beautiful. And obviously I love your palms. Um, and, yeah, I encourage people to log on to um, the website and to purchase Nat's book. So I've just got a few questions for you, yeah. Nat, yeah. and um, you can answer them however you wish. But, yeah, my first one is about this idea of nonfiction poetry and if you want to say any words about your understanding of what that can enable and, and maybe just talking to your own, your book and the poems within it. Yeah, I think this, this, like this book that was at 1.2 manuscripts and became one but had the same I think tone um and it is like definitely a break from previous writing and interestingly enough I feel like I finally was able to write non-fiction poetry when which I feel obviously that these poems are when I just was thinking like the whole time writing these I was just thinking about form and like I know this sounds so simple, but, like, how do you write a poem and, like, what does it look like? And so it became so much more about formal choices and so the content that rushed through happened to be nonfiction and it wasn't until much later when I re-encountered the poems that I was like, wow, the content is, like, very close to my body. And um, But it was because I was kind of looking the other way and I was like, trying to make sure every every line every poem worked and was like doing its job <laughs> sure sure yeah um, a, a lot of the poems are really um there is a sort of personal aspect to it a lot of them are very um seem very um to have a sort of emotional rawness or something ab about yeah. them and um yeah. and that there's a lot of a lot at stake in the poems for, for yes. you personally yeah. Um, so your father figures quite a lot, and we heard just in that poem the mother and sister. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, how did you negotiate those um, yeah. those family members? And do you are you worried at all about yeah, what they might I think? I have been. Yeah. So with my um, with and and you sort of know this too. Maybe um, when I first wrote the poems, I think because I was assuming this. Um, privacy because I was so obsessed with form and um like honestly at the time of writing them was like oh well these are private and they'll never like I'll never share them mm -hmm. so there was that rawness is like very real because there was an audience but it was like me working something out um so I've definitely 
feel like exposed (laughs) Um, but it feels like a risk that's worth it Um, and it's been with my mother and sister has been like um, really exciting because we've had a lot of beautiful conversations and I think that they're quite I wasn't expecting them to be so meaningful for them like um, but I think that they've really connected to it so that's like really cool but I definitely am like nervous Um, but I don't like the, it's sort of like, like I'm sort of, it's tumbled out in a way and has like become, has come into the world in this way where I'm like, well, okay, like I'm just going to be beholden to this experience. (laughs) (laughs) And and also, um, perhaps my final question, I'm interested in the the body in your palms and the body features quite a lot in in the palms is there anything that maybe arose out of the palms about your relationship to your own body and bodies in general and relationships with others through the writing of the palms yeah so I was writing at least half of the poems alongside um like a critical exegetical essay um as part of as part of what was an honors honors yes that's what yes part of honors and the the like truly the methodologies that I was like engaging in or like picking picking up um like I kind of ended up with this idea of a soft open poetics um and that feels really true like everything just feels really soft now and I don't think I would write those poems again because I'm not in that space and there are there are places of growth that like I'm like oh I wish I'd handled that differently than I did in that in the manuscript but um I think that there's like a genuine softness and openness towards myself and others I I love that term soft open poetics yeah more about that do you want to say more about it well if it's funny because I just I think that these poems also are like pretty spiky so like (laughs) so something about writing spiky poems was also a part of getting to the soft open space Mm. Um, lack of vulnerability in them yeah yeah Mm. um yeah I think um I mean do you want me to talk about like theory and stuff because that's where I'm about to go and I'm (laughs) holding back from going briefly Briefly. very briefly so um so Sarah Ahmed, obviously cultural politics and motion, just like that. I really used that um, idea of her, the ideas of the board, like how she speaks about, especially queer feelings and melancholia, which I think um, how she connects and grief. Um, and I was obviously grieving something and in her work, I found um, like words for my grief and that allowed me to feel like I was in my body. Mm. Like it, lo- it helped me to locate myself. Yeah. And I felt less lonely, which is really cool. Um, and I think I'm going to say her name wrong. Lynn Hyginian? Hey. Oh, Hyginian? Lynn Hyginian. Hyginian, yeah. yeah. Um, like the language of inquiry and the open text. That was really beautiful. Um, is there a cat? There is a cat next to me. Yeah. 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 He's um, curious about poetry. Yeah. And other, and Eve, Eve Cedric, if that's this is the last one I'll say, um, like reparative reading and an accumu- accumulative reading, I really tried to. I don't even. I don't can't say I even understand that essay, but I feel like it. Aff- it had like it effectively mm-hmm. transformed my work, even though half the time I was like, I'm gonna need to reread that sentence. <laughs> <laughs> so that was. It was very genuine. Like it was very genuine. Like I was like, oh, my brain and body are like brain. My brain, but you know, my situation was doing something. Mm. And you really sense that in the palms as well, that there is a, a response to not not only what's going on in your world and memories and um, yeah. and grief and mm-hmm. feelings and emotions, but also your responses to these texts that are helping you to sort through those yeah. ideas as well. So yeah. thank you so much, Nat. Thank you. Those thank questions you for having your me. Palms. And, um, and, yep, thank you to our okay. audience as well. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> And, uh, yeah, so thanks, Nat and Antonia and Alice, and I hope you enjoyed this session. Beautiful. Bye, everyone. Should I? All right, yeah.